Tonight's reading is Psalm 32. Hear God's word. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the, the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. This is the word of the Lord. on there we go great stuff good evening everyone welcome from my side as well uh, great to see you here um, whether you are in formal ministry or just uh, informal ministry as you are a christian and you go about the only thing that happens to you as well but from time to time you get certain themes that arise as you are engaging with people and i must say over the last two months uh, people struggling with guilt this been something that has uh, come to light for me, and as we're doing some once-offs for the rest of this term, uh, I thought it would be a, a great topic just to look at this evening, because in a sense, we all struggle with that, because we all struggle with sin. Learn already alluded to that, and so let me pray for us, and then we're going to look at David and look at Psalm 32 and see what we can learn there about guilt and how to live a guilt-free life, because really, it's not that difficult to do, as we will see. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing opportunity to come and gather again around your words, your people, your spirit present. And Father, as you speak to us, we pray and ask that you'll help us, remind us of the gospel truths and the reality of living in a, uh, in a world and a life that is still broken and affected by sin. And so we pray for your blessing to be upon us now as we turn uh, to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if there's one aspect in life uh, here on earth that eats away at a person more than anything else, it must be guilt. Uh, this is true even of the Christian. So you're welcome here tonight and be reminded that there is a word for you here. The dictionary defines guilt as an awareness of having done wrong or committed a crime accompanied by feelings of shame and regret. Uh, guilt is feeling bad about what we did Shame is feeling bad about who we are. So in a sense, guilt is objective and shame is subjective. Guilt is the awareness of having fallen short of a specific standard. Shame comes from letting yourself or others down. I mean, go right back to Genesis chapter 3. You look there at Adam and Eve as they sinned, as she took that fruit, as Adam didn't stop his wife to, from, from obeying God's word and was supposed to tell her. That awareness of knowing they disobeyed God's word, that's guilt. Or that action of seeking to hide from God and um, covering up their nakedness as they felt exposed, that is shame. Guilt is usually tied to an event, I did something bad. Shame is tied to a person, I am bad, or I'm not good enough. One author says, guilt is the wound and shame is the scar. In a sense, that which is left behind, eating away, perhaps still at you. And many people struggle with guilt, and it affects both their relationship with God, but also with others. And so this evening, I want us to consider how we can live free of guilt. Well, for that, I want us to consider Psalm 32 and several aspects related to guilt. So do follow along there. The specific parts and stanzas will be on the screen as well. Firstly, we see here in this psalm that guilt is common. It is common to all of mankind, and it's common in two ways. Firstly, because we fall short of a standard. We live in a fallen world where people sin, where you and I sin, where we are sinned against. Paul says in Romans that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
Of all people, David knows that. And he knows the weight that sin brings. The consequences, the condemnation, the curse. And he knows the importance of having your sins forgiven. So have a look there at verse 1 and 2. In fact, the psalm starts on a very positive note. It says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. Because sin is so common in all of our lives, guilt is common. We know we fall short of God's standards. We do not love God as we should, and we do not love one another as we should. And probably even worse, we don't love the world out there as much as what we should. And there are, of course, those whom God has given over to their sinful depravity to such an extent that they have got no guilty conscience at all. And instead, they feed off the horrible and sickening crimes they plan and commit. Well, a day is coming when they will regret every evil act and when guilt will consume them for an eternity. Unless they take seriously what God has to say even to us tonight. So can I say to you, perhaps this evening, whether you're a Christian, maybe you're an unbeliever looking in here and coming and joining us tonight, that if you do not have a struggle with guilt, you need to reassess your heart and your relationship with God. Because all of us struggle with this at some point, and probably more regularly than we actually would like to admit as well. So we fall short of a standard. That's the reality. That's true. That's why this world is in such a mess. But then secondly, under the fact that it's common, is that we fail others and we fail self. Sense of failure can also result in guilt. Such failure might have nothing to do with God's laws. Perhaps it comes from a cultural norms and the pressure that accompanies that. Maybe you're a mom and you're feeling guilty for not being able to breastfeed your baby. Or a child who seeks a career in a specific trade rather than pursue that PhD that their parents all their life dreamed for them to get. Or perhaps a student not tipping the car god as his parents used to do. And none of these are sinful against God. Rather, it feels like we failed someone else. Or even that we failed ourselves. You ever feel like that? You are a failure. Ever done good enough for yourself? That's especially where shame arises. So let me just say, do not be fooled by false guilt. Go to the Bible to see that uh, if what you are feeling is in fact going against God's word or not, because of your actions or your thoughts, or your lack of doing something that you think you should have done. And if still unsure, speak to a trusted Christian. Speak to one of us on the pastoral staff. And yet there will be times that we act unlovingly towards others and we fail them. And we do fail God. Now either way, whether it's a false or a genuine guilt, it is so easy to fall for lies. Satan loves to deceive us with regard to our sin and failures. He wants you. He wants you tonight to believe that you are not good enough, that you are not doing enough that you're not able to stop sinning. You may say to yourself, this is just who I am. <laughs> Can't help to get angry. Can't help to get despondent. Can't help to stop cheating on my tax returns. Ed Walsh, a famous counselor and author says the following, he says, Satan tempts us with lies that God is not that good and sin is not that bad. Then when we sin, he's right there to say that our sin is exceedingly bad and forgiveness is out of the question. And we are prone to believe him. And what do we do then? Well, we seek ways to appease God and our own guilty feelings. Maybe we have a pity party for a certain time. And we withdraw completely. Or we hide from God because we don't feel worthy. So we don't go to church. We don't read the word. We pray less. And we land up withdrawing into the spiritual vortex. Or we seek to do better. 
So we tithe a few extra percent for a couple of months. Or perhaps we do our, our utmost best to be better at our Bible studies and to do sermon prep. Remember years ago, for me, that was a great thing. Whenever I felt that I wasn't living up to what I should be doing and being as good as I should be, I was motivated to put extra hours in my early years of ministry. I recognize it now, I wish I knew it then. <laughs> and suddenly you fall into the trap of legalism, of works of righteousness, and we miss grace completely. God's free favor on us, knowing that he's there. He's given us everything in life for salvation, to be able to grow and be the very people that he calls us to be. And when neither of these work, whether it's a pity party or giving extra, and they don't work, by the way, I hope you've realized that, then we feel even more guilty and suddenly it feels like our guilt is crushing us, which is the second aspect here. We've already said that sin and guilt is closely connected, uh, seeking to deal with it in your own strength, whether you try to ignore, rationalize, or hide it, is pointless, does not work. In fact, your guilt and shame will eat away at you steadily from the inside out. Kind of think of that Bible verse that speaks about the devil, Satan being like a lion seeking to devour. <laughs> well, Satan's busy eating you from the inside out. <laughs> and it will cause more misery as you are left to your own thoughts. And that's where David goes in Psalm 32, verse 3. Have a look at there, verse 3. He says, When I kept silent, that is, when I didn't turn to God, when I didn't talk to him, when I didn't engage with a trusted friend, when I was having that pity party, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. Here we see David having physical and emotional distress, unable to function as he should. The king, having got all the power, is sitting there groveling in his own guilt and shame. Like someone with brittle bone disease, he finds himself to be unstable and weak and in pain. It's a very unpleasant and uncomfortable experience to be in. And his groaning is getting the better of him as well as the people around him. Do you realize that your guilt, your shame, your regret affects those around you negatively? Not only your relationship with God, but it's actually the relationship with others. And so division is caused. And so Satan breaks down the church. The feeling of despondency that accompanies guilt is real. It's often witnessed when you refrain from owning up to someone that you have let down. I mean, think about this as an example. Maybe you're house sitting for somebody and they said, please be careful of this one vase or the 56 inch TV. I don't know how big they get today. I saw a guy in a bucky yesterday driving at the back standing with this big TV. I'm like, yay, yay, yay. Anyways. So you go house sit for this person, the next moment you break that vase or the TV, whichever one is your choice. Now do you try and fix it? Do you replace it? Vase may be easier, although it won't look the same. You won't have the money for the TV, so. Do you try and get rid of it and hope that they do not notice? <laughs> well, we know that's not gonna work. Or do you tell them? Ever been in that situation? If something went wrong, <laughs> and you need to own up to what's gone wrong, because <laughs> who are you trusting in there? You're trusting yourself, aren't you? <laughs> Not relying on God to help you deal with the situation. I don't want to really skip ahead now, but isn't it always better just to own up <laughs> and to seek forgiveness? Always better to tell the truth. Honesty is the best policy. Now, I would not be surprised if David is thinking in this psalm here about his uh, account with Bathsheba and the snowball effect that it subsequently had. 
trying to justify his desires and actions, led him into a deeper and darker corner of despair. And eventually there was no way out. Guilt must have eaten away at him. Eventually, even more so, when Nathan came and rebuked him. And I think before that happened, his only conclusion seems to be that God is coming down on him because of his sin. Look at verse 4. Saying, I kept silent, been in this emotional and physical distress, my bones wasting away, I'm being groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me, my strength was set as in the heat of summer. Ever felt like that? This burden just crunching down on you steadily, more and more and more, and the more you try to fight out of it, it's like quicksand, just causing more pressure. As David is left with his own thoughts and reasoning, he concludes that this is payback from God. It has to be. <laughs> what else can it be? For falling short of God's standards, his holy standards. Because of his own disobedience, God is coming down on him. Perhaps you are feeling like that right now. You start reflecting on your entire past that you can remember and all the things that you've done wrong. The people you've hurt. The people you've let down, whether it's through your own choices or not. And as you pause and take stock of terrible things happening to you right now, maybe your conclusion is that God is punishing you. That you are receiving payback for the horrible thing that you have done or what you have neglected to do. There where you have not been loving to God and others. Maybe that is you. And if you are a genuine Bible-believing Christian, somebody who's trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation of your sins, please remember that God does not punish his children. That is very important to understand. More on dealing with folk who struggle with guilt, there's, there's a sense that God is punishing them. God does not punish his children. But he may very well be disciplining you. There's a huge difference between the two. The difference between punishment and discipline is that the latter includes grace. It includes God's loving grace. What a wonderful thing for us to think of as we with, with children discipline our children. We don't punish, we discipline. Timothy Lane, uh, another well-known Author says, the wonderful truth of the gospel is that you are free to struggle honestly before God because you know He loves you and will not let you go. It's incredible. He loves you so much that He may send hardship into your life to get your attention. Plenty of spaces in the Bible to turn to, to, to verify that truth. Lane says, this is not punishment but the loving discipline of your heavenly Father. So expect to be disciplined by your heavenly Father. Don't be fooled by Satan's deception where he wants you to think that because of your sin, God no longer loves you. That's not true. <laughs> Got the council tomorrow night, we're looking at the whole aspect of anger. Now it's not quite deception, but the same applies where we see God's love and his anger is to the it, it goes hand in hand. God doesn't like your sin, but he's going to discipline you for your own good and because he loves you. I need to discipline my child, actually all four of them, because I know it's for their greater good. And by that, setting an example for how they should live life in light of God's word. But there's always grace and love. And even there sometimes, I must say, there where I struggle with guilt, where maybe it's not always the most loving discipline, it's probably more like punishment sometimes. But then even when I realize that I can come back and say, my boy, my, my daughter, I can, please forgive me. <laughs> Remember God's grace, I had to. Discipline is very important. Don't be fooled by Satan. 
Also, do not put all hardships coming your own or your way down to God disciplining you. So many people think that God is disciplining them for everything that they've done wrong. <laughs> and so that every struggle that come your way, every difficulty, every trial, every heartache is because of their sin, and that's also not always true. So stop punishing also yourself by adding more guilt to your life through penance, where people beat themselves up, sometimes physically or emotionally, to try and get away with their guilt. It's not going to work. Satan's going to want you to believe those lies. If you fall into the devil's trap, you will very quickly become extremely despondent. It's so no wonder guilt will eventually lead somebody into depression and anxiety where your strength will be sapped away and you will feel crushed under guilt. Whether it is God's discipline or not, either way, it does give you a chance to reflect on your life and areas where God wants to seek correction, where he wants to bring about gospel change. And herein lies the hope of living a guilt-free life. For guilt, thirdly, is curable. Have a look there at verse 5. David goes on and he says, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. There's something good about guilt. Hope you're starting to realize that. When your conscience says to you that you are guilty, it is in fact the Holy Spirit at work in your heart. Thank the Lord for that. God is saying that you need to do something about it. Turn your feelings of guilt to godly remorse, which leads to repentance. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 to 11 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, no shame. <laughs> but worldly sorrow brings death. Believe Satan is going to eat away at your guilt. <laughs> Verse 11, see what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves. What indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern. What readiness to see justice done. The cure for guilt is as simple as this. Repent of your sin and trust in Jesus. That's the answer. <laughs> God promises that he will forgive you your sin if you truly confess it before him. Have a look again at verse 5. Then I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. Now that word iniquity, especially in the Hebrew, has got that sense of guilt built in with it. <laughs> David goes on and says, I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. I think he's probably written Psalm 51 after this. We all know Psalm 51. That's David's true confession, heartfelt confession about not only sin with Bathsheba, but everything else that followed after that. But yet he knew, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Here is a man that's committed every possible horrible crime under this universe, under the sun, and God forgave him and took away his guilt as well. God can do that to King David. He can do it to you. Not only does God forgive your sin, but he forgives your guilt as well. It's not me saying it. It's God saying. We saw that in Hebrews 10 earlier. Many people struggle with the fact they believe that God has forgiven their sin, but they can't get to the point where they realize that their guilt has been washed away as well. Don't believe that lie. God sets you free from the bondage of both sin and the guilt that accompanies it. Now, there may very well be consequences for your actions. Just note that. But despite that, you can still live in the freedom that only Christ offers you. Let me quote Timothy Lane again. He says, You can devise all kinds of ways to try to get rid of your guilty feelings, but your guilt is not just a feeling or a personal problem. It really has to do with your relationship with God. How you deal with your guilt depends on how you view God and what place he has in your life. So do you recognize now how 
important a personal relationship with Jesus is in order to address your guilt. Where do you run to? Where do you turn to? Turning to yourself is not going to work. Turning to other devices or things will not work. Only to Christ. And so what does this then look like practically as we live knowing that we are not perfect yet in this world? This life we will still sin, guilt will come to us again. So how do we deal with it practically? Well, firstly, then we've got to take it to the cross of Christ. Believe that on the cross, uh, Christ, Christ dealt with your sin, your sorrow, and your guilt. So pray and repent. Look at verse 6. David says, Therefore, let all the faithful, those who believe in God, pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. I think David is probably remembering God's mighty power as he rescued his people from slavery in Egypt through the Red Sea there. And it's that same power that's at work in your salvation and in your sanctification becoming more like Christ, able to set you free from your sin and guilt. And can I say, not only must you turn to the cross of Christ, but you turn to those when you have wronged them, and you seek their forgiveness for where you've sinned against them. And perhaps you've sought to do that, and perhaps that person's been unwilling to forgive you, and they're not able to forgive you yet. But as long as you've taken to God and sought his forgiveness, you can live free from guilt. Let that other person deal with God about it. So we turn to Christ, turn to others. Hold firm to your identity as a child of God. Have a look at verse 7. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Get this image here of this young child seeking protection with his mom or dad. Now our youngest, whenever he hears a, a big bike coming or revving there past whatever house, whatever, he just gets a fright and he runs to one of us, clenching in underneath our arms. That's the picture here. And so in the same way we can run to God, we find shelter under his wing. Knowing and believing this will safeguard you against legalism and will help you to stand firm in grace. Because it is by grace that we are saved and it is by grace that we are changed. Never forget about grace. <laughs> Instead of a guilty conscience, we can approach God's throne of grace with freedom and confidence. No matter what we've done. God wants you to do so. That is why he gave his son to die for you, so that you can come to him, so that you can have free access to him. Kevin DeYoung says, deeper grace will produce better gratitude, which means less guilt. Deeper grace will produce better gratitude, which means less guilt. And better gratitude leads to a deeper desire for obedience. The more we obey, the less we will fall short of God's glory and the less reason to feel guilty. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I'm not talking about legalistic obedience where we try and win favor with God. I'm just talking about obedience through growth in Christ. <laughs> As we're able to put certain idolatries behind us, certain sins behind us, we grow. We don't have to worry about feeling guilty about those anymore. Whether it's pornography, maybe stealing, like I said, on our taxes or swearing, or drinking too much. Of course, there will be other aspects that God will reveal in your heart that will bring, will bring guilt about again, but then you deal with it in the same way that we're saying. By living a life of faith and repentance. When you are struggling with a sin that repeats itself, continue to bring it before Jesus. Keep fighting and seek accountability from a fellow Christian. It's always a good sign if you keep fighting. Do be aware of habitual sin, though. Have someone that you can walk the road with. Pray and ask that the Lord will give you the desire and power to change. And also in obedience to use you to wisely counsel others who struggle with guilt. 
So have a look at verses 8 to 10 as David is now coming and closing up the psalm. It says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. Now, I'm not too sure here, but it almost seems like now God is speaking to David and speaking to us, but it could very well still be David speaking to us and God speaking to us through his word, but whichever way, the same truths apply. It says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. See, there's a, a desire here for us to be obedient and to help others to walk that life of faith in obedience as well. That's what it means to love others. And finally, by living a guilt-free life, you can rejoice in the Lord. Have a look at verse 11 as it closes. David says, Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you who are upright in heart. David turns from remaining silent before the Lord, early in the psalm, to hear singing praises to him out loud. What a better way to live than to be consumed and crushed by your guilt. Do you agree with that? A joyful life is possible when we understand we can live a life free of guilt. So do not ignore your guilty conscience. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And remember what Paul says to the Christians in Romans 8, 33 to 34. It says, there, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. If you're still feeling guilty right now, God, Jesus himself, is there next to his Father interceding for you. What a great promise. Knowing that he is right there now for you and me. Our sin and guilt washed away by Christ's blood. And Jesus is reminding his father of that right now. What freedom we have in that. Amen. I'm going to ask you just to reflect perhaps on those areas of guilt and sin that you may have still present in your life. Maybe something stood out for you tonight as God spoke to you. So when you take a few moments, bring it before God, and the music team in the meanwhile will come up and then close for us in song.